Hello, my name is Laura Bell. I am a fourth year student at Southern California College of Optometry. I'm partnering with Dr. Mai and Dr. Lam at Insight Vision Center Optometry to create videos for other doctors about common conditions relating to cornea and contact lenses. In this video, I will be talking about keratoconus. Let's start with a definition. Keratoconus is a bilateral, asymmetric, non-inflammatory corneal condition that leads to progressive corneal ectasia, inferior steepening, and scarring. Here is an illustration that compares a normal cornea on the left and a keratoconic cornea on the right. As you can see, the thinning causes the cornea to protrude and take on a cone-like shape. This happens due to breaks in Bowman's membrane and stromal thinning. Keratoconus can lead to reduced visual acuity due to progressive myopia, induced irregular stigmatism, and corneal scarring. It typically presents in the teens and 20s, and early symptoms include blurry, distorted vision, halos and glare, especially at night, and ocular irritation. Keratoconus typically progresses more rapidly in younger patients and stabilizes around 20 years after initial onset. Prevalence data estimates that about 0.14% of people globally have keratoconus. There are both genetic and environmental factors that are involved in the development of keratoconus. Those with a family history of keratoconus have a higher risk of developing the condition. It is also more commonly seen in males and in African American and Latino populations. Down syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos, osteogenesis imperfecta, and retinitis pigmentosa are all conditions with an increased risk of keratoconus. In addition, ocular irritation due to eye rubbing, contact lenses, or ocular allergies can damage corneal tissues and increase the risk of keratoconus or increase the progression for somebody who already has the condition. In fact, eye rubbing is the number one most significant risk factor for keratoconus. So it's very important to educate your patients to refrain from rubbing their eyes. Now let's talk about diagnosing keratoconus. Here are some things to look out for during a comprehensive eye exam that may point to keratoconus. You may see distorted Myers on autorefraction, a scissoring reflex on retinoscopy, high K values, usually over 47 diopters, high amounts of myopia and astigmatism. We typically see with the rule astigmatism in the early stages, which is due to inferior corneal steepening. However, due to protrusion of the cornea, irregular astigmatism is seen in later stages. You may also see asymmetric refractive data between the two eyes, variable responses on manifest refraction, and the patient may not be refractable to 2020. Here are some signs you may see while performing a slit lamp examination. Munson sign is a visible protrusion of the cornea when a patient looks down. This can sometimes be seen even without a slit lamp. Fleischer's ring is iron deposition in Desimé's membrane around the base of the cone. Voigt striae are fine vertical folds in the posterior stroma of the cornea. If you suspect a patient may have keratoconus, topography and tomography are warranted to check anterior corneal curvature, corneal thickness, and anterior and posterior elevation. Topography can be used to assess anterior corneal curvature. When looking at an axial map on topography, keratoconus often presents with a characteristic inferior steepening pattern that looks like a teardrop. The steep K value will also be higher than normal, usually greater than 47 diopters. Tomography can measure corneal thickness as well as anterior and posterior elevation. Normal corneal thickness is about 550 microns and keratoconic eyes tend to have thinner corneas. This is again due to stromal thinning. When looking at anterior and posterior elevation of the cornea, we typically look for asymmetry with the posterior cornea being more elevated than the anterior cornea. Now that we have discussed keratoconus diagnosis, let's talk about treatment options for keratoconus. Because of the corneal thinning, corneal steepening, and induced irregular astigmatism in keratoconus, the cornea is no longer a smooth refracting surface. This is why glasses and soft contact lenses may not provide adequate vision for some patients. 
In these instances, hard contact lenses are a great option. Rigid gas permeable lenses, scleral lenses, and hybrid lenses can all create a smooth refracting surface for light to enter a keratoconic eye and create a clear image on the retina. However, it is important to remember that using contact lenses for keratoconus does not halt the progression of the condition. It only corrects for the refractive error and provides clear vision. Gas permeable lenses are smaller, allow for great tear exchange, and are easy to handle. They can cause lens awareness and some discomfort, but many patients are still successful with these lenses. To improve the comfort of a GP lens, a soft lens can be worn in between the cornea and the GP. This is called piggybacking. Sclera lenses are the largest and vault the entire cornea, landing on the sclera. The lens is filled with saline solution and applied to the eye from below, which allows for suction on the eye. These lenses can be tricky to apply and remove at first, but they're very comfortable. Hybrid lenses are hard in the center and soft on the edges. It's essentially a GP lens bonded to a soft skirt. The soft skirt provides improved comfort compared to a normal GP lens. They are applied like a scleral lens and also vault the cornea. Corneal crosslinking is an option to prevent the progression of keratoconus. Because the goal of crosslinking is to prevent progression and not to improve vision, Keratoconus patients who undergo crosslinking typically still need to wear refractive correction with hard contact lenses. Here you can see that in corneal crosslinking, a combination of UVA radiation and a riboflavin solution that is applied to the eye creates a photochemical reaction that encourages the formation of new collagen bonds in the stroma. This strengthens the cornea and prevents further thinning. Corneal crosslinking is recommended for younger patients because they have the highest rates of progression. Here is a photo of Intax, which is another option for treating keratoconus. Intax are two arc-like segments that are inserted into the posterior stroma of the cornea and are designed to flatten the central cornea. This is considered an alternative treatment to a corneal transplant when the patient is no longer successful in contact lenses. Although intact does improve vision, patients typically still need glasses or contact lenses after this procedure. In fact, intax may allow a patient to be able to return to contact lens wear who was previously unsuccessful in contact lenses. Lastly, a penetrating keratoplasty or a corneal transplant may be considered as a last resort when all other options have been exhausted. Here you can see the cornea is replaced with healthy donor tissue. Penetrating keratoplasties are considered in cases of severe scarring, severe corneal thinning, and contact lens intolerance. That is all the information I have on keratoconus today. I hope you enjoyed learning about how to diagnose and treat this condition. For more videos, please visit our YouTube channel at Insight Vision OC. Thank you so much for watching.